That's your first mistake. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Jim Christopher, I am the curriculum director for enterprise content at Pluralsight. Um, anybody heard of Pluralsight? Yeah, yeah. so um, I basically help curate all of their enterprise content, authors, uh, et cetera. Is that not working at all? Is it, is it up? Awesome. Thank you, Jeffrey Snover. Jeffrey Snover, ladies and gentlemen. It's actually, it is a, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people know that Jeffrey actually, um, uh, you, you you have a physics PhD, is that correct? No, I'm a dropout. Well, that's what I was getting to. Was that yeah? He he's a he's a dropout. He actually uh, he got started here in the Charlotte office as an AV technician. He didn't. I'm lying. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the dropout thing is very interesting. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, yeah. So that's me. That's me now. Um, up until. Up until November, I was an independent software engineer. I ran my own company. The company still exists. Um, actually, the only source of income is the content that I created for Pluralsight uh, comes into that company now. So, um, if you have any questions about what you're seeing, that's the contact information. Um, and uh, I'm an MVP. And uh, I actually didn't get started in code and technology. Uh, I've literally never taken a computer science class. You, if you look at my repositories, you probably know that by now. Uh, but yeah, my background is actually in psychology. And even before that, I didn't. I, I was studying music composition, so I, was, I had this really kind of crooked path to where I, where I got to today. Um, but this is very relevant, right? Uh, I was in a PhD program for cognitive psychology. I was studying human perception, learning, performance, uh, studying vision and hearing. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, I ended up dropping out. Uh, not because I had this great job opportunity, but just because I couldn't stand academia. I just could not live, I was not going to succeed. Uh, so I decided one day, I was just like, that's it, I'm done. Got my master's degree and left. Uh, it turns out my first job was working with a team uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope. So it was a step in the right direction, I think. Uh, and I don't want to give you the impression that, you know, I was the guy who was like, hey, everyone, shh, let's put a telescope in space. And, you know, no, it wasn't me. Like, I was the guy like slinging code for one of the engineers who reported to the junior intern scientist who wasn't even getting paid to do stuff at the University of Arizona in the optics department. But still, like that's the background that I'm coming from, right? A lot of science, a lot of data, right? That's why it's relevant. Um, to, I, I am a very visual thinker is the short way of putting all that. I guess I just could have said that. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a words guy, so you gotta bear with me. Uh, let's talk about the formatting system in PowerShell. Um, right, we all kind of, we're all experts here. I know I'm not gonna go through what a pipeline is and all that stuff, but you know, you guys understand like objects in, objects out, and then formatting just sort of happens at the end, right? So like, uh, you know, it's always like the big reveal, you know, the aha moment for people learning PowerShell is when they realize that the crap they see in the console isn't really the output, it's just formatting of the output, right? So we can take objects and show them in tables and lists, wide lists, uh, and then we have custom. Uh, and you know, there's, there's other things you can do. There's the, like the grid view. Uh, basically, like our options when we're working inside of PowerShell using the standard formatting system are all text. And text is good. It's readable by definition, it's text. Um, the, uh, but uh, you know, again, it, it, it becomes very hard for a guy like me who wants to see a picture, right? Uh, like a number is good, a number is tractable, but um, like a graph tells me a whole lot more than, than, than that. So again, if I can just look at a graph, like, oh yeah, I get it, um, uh, that's, um, that's much better for me. And that's kind of where this idea came for, for Seashell. Um, in a nutshell, uh, what Seashell is, is it does graphing, uh, plotting uh, from the pipeline, right, from, from the shell. Uh, so this, I started this in 2012 as a commercial product, started as an MVP, minimum viable product, um, and um, had kind of, I mean, I, honestly, minimum is kind of a, a loose term. It had a whole bunch of features. It had 24 types of charts. Um, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. Grids, uh, you could do network diagrams, which is like super handy. If you had a connected graph of objects, you could just splay them out and kind of see how they're organized. Uh, it would do maps, like you could, you, could, you could take map data and give it lat launch and it would just you know, plot things out and you could, it, was just, it was awesome, right? And uh, it looked awesome and it used these commercial controls from, uh, where are they? Oh, and gauges. It used these commercial controls from Infragistics that were relatively expensive, um, but they were beautiful, right? And they, they, you know, there's a lot of work to get them working the way I wanted them to, uh, but it was very easy to get sort of that consistent look and feel. 
uh, across all of them. Uh, and again, yeah, so they, like radial charts and you know the common bar charts and you know lines. But this is what I mean. Like when you look at when I'm looking at numbers, I can say, oh, that number's kind of high. But when you show me a graph, I can actually tell, like, oh wow, like that. Yeah, I can say, like, that's a significant change, or that's not. Um, so again, I love numbers, like performance counters are like one of my favorite things in the universe. Um, yeah, so that the seashell in uh, 2015, um, I'm I'm gutting it. I'm gutting it, and the reason why. Well, so let me back up. When I when I started selling seashell, I was actually really amazed at how the community just sort of came together uh, behind it. Uh, and totally ignored it. <laughs> uh, just like you know, I, I was I was trying to figure out why, um, and I started poking around, and uh, you know, I did web searches on seashell or whatever, um, and then I got smart and I did web search on seashell with an A S E A S H A S S H S H E L L, and uh, and then I started, I started finding stuff on Posh Code that was like I don't want to pay for seashell, so I wrote this. Um, and it was like, yeah, it was like, well, it does like two chart types, but that's all I need and I don't care. And that's, that's kind of when my brain was like, yeah, that minimum part of the MVP, you didn't do that. You did way too much. Uh, and and I, sort of, I started thinking about it. I started looking at what other people were doing in the marketplace. Um, and I kind of decided like, you know, if you're going to make a tool to help people code PowerShell, you could probably sell that, right? That's Sapiens model. They're trying to help you get stuff done with PowerShell. If you want to do something with PowerShell, like a module to extend its features, you're probably not gonna be able to sell that. Like I don't, I don't see a, a way to sell it because as soon as you put something out there, like it, this is basic bottom line. This is staked out as like an open source thing, right? This is an open source space that you're entering, and as soon as you put something out there, people are gonna be like, "That sounds awesome. I can write that in a couple of days, and it'll work. It'll work. It'll work fine." You know, and that's kind of that's kind of what I experienced with Seashell. So, um, drop the commercial model. Stripping out all of the commercial components so it doesn't cost me anything anymore. So instead of the infragistics controls, I'm now in the process of getting Oxyplot. If you're familiar with Oxyplot, anyone familiar with Oxyplot? Yeah, a couple of you. Um, Cross-platform, amazing plotting tool set. Um, uh, little, little, little less feature-rich, but still, um, that's that's the goal now. So um, it, it's not ready yet. I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to see a lot of smoke and mirrors here today. There's a lot of stuff that works, uh, but it's not perfect. Um, but you'll see where I'm where I'm at with it. I'm, I'm, it'll be in the gallery eventually, uh, and you'll be able to just pull it down and use it. No license, no nothing. So um, you can have fun with it. All right. And I'll, it'll ship with about eight chart types, and they're the charts that you would expect: bars and lines and curves and dots. Nothing special, right? And if if people start asking, I'll start looking at folding in some of the other stuff. Uh, so let's talk about a plot, the anatomy of a plot, and um, the the purpose of this is just sort of build a common lingo between all of us so that when I'm showing you the commandlets and whatnot that um, uh, you know how it reads, right? So, so, so this is a plot. Um, we have stuff going up and down over here. We have stuff going across the bottom, right? And I, I don't mean to belabor this, but you know, if, if the, the, the issue here is like there's a, there's a label down here, uh, code owl, seashell, common at DLL, and this bar represents some aspect of data related to that particular label, right? And um, so you know, running up and down, we have values. Those are the values that we're plotting. Uh, across the bottom, we have labels for those values, right? And it's sort of your brain just sort of organizes them visually. Uh, and then, like the whole group of data that's in the plot, uh, we call a series. Uh, and so you can have multiple series in this plot. Like if there was another metric I was taking on those files, there would be a different color bar for each label, right? So I'd have two values for each label. Each bar would represent a series of values, right? Any questions about that? Nope. All right. Uh, so in terms of uh, the plot commandlets, right? Those those things become uh, parameters to uh, some of the seashell commands. We'll talk about this in a second. Uh, basically, the values that you're plotting, that's the plot parameter. What do you want to plot? The uh, the labels you want to use, that's the by. So you're plotting by what? And uh, the series. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, this is more more easily shown by example uh, is called the across parameter. Uh, and again, the word may not make sense. It'll probably make more sense when we, when we see it. So how about I stop talking and telling and show you. Does that sound good? Yes. All right. Uh, boom, boom. <coughs> 
There we go. All right, so this is uh, ISC, obviously, and I have uh, I have already loaded uh, the C shell module. Uh, and again, this is like an iterum build, so I, I kind of loaded it manually. I basically just took all the DLLs and sucked them in. Um, uh, just give you an idea uh, of what you're looking at. Uh, if I do a get module and what's actually loaded <coughs> in here, uh, what you're going to see is a whole bunch of common stuff. If you've seen any of my other projects, there's you know a common path and provider, uh, and then there's a bunch of C shell stuff. There's command lists, there's providers, there's a visualization DLL, uh, and they all do very specific things. Um, and uh, if we look at the commands uh, for the module, let's see, code owls. If we look at the commandlets that are defined for, um, uh, this would be inside of the C shell module, but right now we're just actually looking inside of the DLL. Uh, this is it, right? Uh, there's, there's, there's one, two, three, or five right now. There used to be about 20, uh, but I cut most of them out. There's just, there's one, really one now that's devoted to visualization, and that's out chart, right? Easy to remember. What do you think it does? Outputs a chart. It outputs a chart, thank you. Um, convert to image, uh, export image, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, so, you know, let's look at an example uh, first off. So let's clear this out and um, just run this manually real quick. All right. All right, so I, if I do an LSO star, right, I get back a list of files that start with O, right? And these are all the oxyplot DLLs and related files that are inside of this project. Uh, and you can see there's a name property, right? And there's a length property. Um, and uh, if I want to plot that, I just have to do something along these lines. So I take that list of objects, LSO, and in fact, if you look up here, this is what I'm going to run, right? That highlighted code right there. So uh, LSO star, give me a list of everything that starts with O, pipe that to out chart. I want to name the chart files. It's going to be a column chart. And I want to plot the length by the name, right? So remember the, the diagram we had where the, the plot goes up and the, the by goes across? Plotting the length by the name. Uh, let's go ahead and run that. <laughs> let's not delete the command, and let's rather run the command. All right, and boom, that's it. Right, um, and you can see it, it's like plotting the O files by their length. Right, so um, that's the big idea. Like literally, I just showed you what C shell is meant to do. That's it. Um, everything I'm going to show you from this point forward is just kind of other things I figured out along the way that you, you can do with this. So, um, all right, any questions so far? No? All right. Again, ask as we go. Uh, I would rather you get the questions answered earlier than uh, get confused and go down the wrong road. So, um, here's another great example. If you look at this, this example that's in the, the ISC now, uh, it's almost the same thing. Uh, except uh, I'm, I'm still getting a list of files to start with O, but instead of plotting a property, I'm plotting a script block, right? So what's going to happen is it's going to take each of those objects and sort of run the script block on it and create the value and then plot that against the name, All right? So let's run that. All right, so it's just dynamically calculating that, that plot property based on the, the contents of that script block. Uh, and again, you can see some of the other nice things. It's, uh, it's actually, um, it's got the, the series label right. It's actually using the script block code that you typed in to actually label that series so you can identify it. Uh, again, first, first bit of smoke and mirrors, not really smoke and mirrors, but the first bug that I want to point out to you. Uh, like if you look at the y-axis, the label's absolutely wrong. Um, that's, not what, that's not what that thing is called. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about why that's happening. Well, I'm not sure. We can talk about why that's happening, but I'll show you how to fix it uh, in, an, in a subsequent example. But, but again, you know, the script block, again, it's supposed to look just like a for each or a where object. Um, you know, the dollar under is the current thing, and you can calculate whatever you want to off of that value. Any questions? Nope. All right. All right, so... Um, Let's talk about that um, uh, that y axis, right? That, that y axis label. Um, one of the things that you can do with the out chart command line, it's got a, you can specify dynamic parameters to it. And this is um, this is something I I like to do when it makes sense. Um, 
And I think it makes sense in this case, right? So let me try to sell it to you. Uh, this is the exact same plot, right? Give me a list of files to start with O, plot a column plot, and I want to plot the length by the name. Uh, and there's this extra parameter at the end, you know, uh, dash length. And you'll notice that the name of that parameter actually matches the name of the, the value we're going to plot, right? So the, the name of the series is now a parameter inside of the out chart commandlet, right? Uh, what do you think the little string after it is trying to represent? Yeah, so it's a, it's a string containing the word bytes comma light blue, right? So I, I'm literally saying the length is measured in bytes and I want to see it in a light blue color. Right. Um, and uh, if we pray to the demo gods, right, and there, it works. So now the y-axis is saying, yeah, no, no, yeah, it's absolutely bytes uh, and we have this light, nice light blue color. Does your window dynamically grow as you have? Excellent question, yeah. So, you know, I, I see this every day and um, you sort of forget that, but yeah, the window can what do if whatever. If you have less of them to plot, does it, when it pops up initially? I'm sorry? If you have less of them to plot, less items to plot than what you have there? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. If we do... Um, like if you were to do two of them? Uh, oh, I see. So if we have two plots open at once? No, no. I mean, like if you have two items that you're, like, you're oh. plotting X against Y. Two series? Okay. Yeah. Hang on to that. We're, we're going to get to that. Um, but yeah, it, it's dynamically just sort of structures that. Okay. Um, all right, so whoop, I didn't mean to get rid of that actually. I wanted to show you something. All right, all right so we got the plot back up here again. Um, so outchart isn't the only command that's in there. There's a couple of other uh, niceties that again, if the visualization series grow, these will apply to, to everywhere. Um, a couple of things, right? Uh, you guys know me. Uh, what's my favorite PowerShell feature? Come on. Providers. Yeah, right. So what do you think what do you think Seashell has got going on behind the scenes? Yeah. So uh, let's take a quick look. If I do a git ps drive, uh, and if we look at what's in there, let me clean this up a little bit. Um, we'll select the uh, name and the provider. Right. Uh, there's two drives that you can see are non-standard. Uh, there's a charts drive and there's a data sources drive. And we'll talk about data sources in a second. Um, if I go into charts, what do you think I'm going to see? Charts. Yeah. So I'll CD, CD into charts and do a DIR. Uh, right now, there's only one chart because I've closed the rest of them. Uh, but you'll notice the name of the chart inside of the, the providers, files2. And if I look at the chart, the, file, the, the plot, I called it files2 as well. Uh, so this, what's in here is actually the, what we call the view model for that chart. Right. Everything that's specified in that chart, the axes, the colors, the series, the data, the bindings, it's all in here. Uh, and you can actually, I'm not going to do this, but you can actually spelunker in here and change the axis, change the orientation of things, move this axis over there if you want, all from script. Right. Just by changing the view model and then on the next update, the plot will just magically fix itself. Uh, again, the idea being that you keep your hands on the keyboard and you can sort of like a GNU plot for, for a PowerShell. Right. Um, all right, but one of the things that you can do with this, right, so we have an, we have an yeah, Lee. So the, the length parameter, how would somebody go about discovering, like, that, that many language? Um, documentation is, is really it. Uh, I'm, I, I've, I've hemmed and hawed about what to do about that. I tried to keep it really, really simple. Uh, at one point, I had um, commandlets to define objects that represented series and scales and descriptors. and um, I looked at it and I was like, no way, no one's going to do that. But if you can say, this is bytes, should be light blue, like that, it's, that seems simple enough that once you discover it, you'll remember it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've hemmed and hawed on that. If you have ideas, I would love to hear them. Is that, is that all that it supports or does it support like scaling and other, everything else? Uh, it, so it, it, in the original version, the commercial version, it supported, um, you, could, you could name the series um, or give it, give it a unit what I call it, a unit, give it a color. Um, you, could, you could define active ranges, like minimums, maximums. You could define key ranges, like if you have a percentage range and you want to know if it hits over 85%. Um, you got color boundaries. So yeah, the, the specifications actually, it can get quite verbose. Uh, and so it looks kind of like a regular expression uh, when you want to specify lots of things. But for, again, the 80-20 rule, most people aren't going to really care about that. So, you know. Um, 
again, you know, trying to position this, like I don't want to create like the PowerShell of Tableau. I just don't want to do that, right? I just want to see some stuff. If it becomes more complicated than that, I'm going to move on to another tool, right? It's kind of kind of my thinking there. Uh, does that answer your question, or did I just completely skirt it? Awesome. Okay, he's not. I'm moving on. Um, any other any other questions before I talk about what you can do with this this view model object? No? All right. Um, there's another commandlet that's available inside of uh, uh, inside of uh, C shell. Uh, it's called export image. And what you can do is you can take um, you can you can dir your charts or select one of those chart objects off of the chart drive, uh, and you can uh, export an image of that chart, and you can export it to a file. And I'm just going to call it um, uh, PSH Summit PNG, uh, and so it created the file. Uh, and if I invoke that, All right there it is. Uh, so literally, like you could create any number of charts and just be like, I just need a snapshot and just DIR charts, export image, and it'll figure out what you want to do and dump them all into a file or dump them into multiple files. Right? It just sort of figures it out. Um, all right, good. All right, so again, anytime, um, anytime you create a chart, it's going to actually show up uh, inside of this charts drive. Right? And that, that, was, that was the only point that I wanted to make there. All right. All right, so let's talk. Let's, um, so that's, that, that, that's like the basics, right? Everything we're going to talk about from this point forward is um, it's a little weird. <laughs> um, so, do you have any questions? Ask them now. Yeah. Is it, is it supported on version five? Uh, sort of. Yeah, I'm having like I'm having issues right now with my providers on five. The drives just sort of disappear, and I don't know why. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, so it works. If uh, I had it working on PowerShell two and up. Uh, ISC and, and the console. You can use in the console too. Yeah. Is it possible to create the chart objects without creating the actual view? So you can just look them off the file? Uh, yeah. So, oh, you just want like the image? <coughs> yeah, just like just the object so then you can outfile it without having to. Uh, I see what stuff. you're saying. Um, you can create the image without creating the, the actual visual, the window. It's just it's part of the WPF. It has to be visible for you to be able to, to dump it out. Um, it is possible. Uh, I have no way of demoing this effectively, but it is possible for you to create the chart, the visualization, and actually return a handle to that WPF object. And you can, so if you're using like, um, uh, what is that? What is the WPF PowerShell thing that? Uh, show GUI. Yeah, show show yeah show UI show GUI show UI show UI. Um, but yeah, so you can like if you if you're using show UI and you create a window and you're like I want to cram a chart in there. You can actually create the chart and just get back the handle to that object and shove it in there, and it just shows up. Right? Uh, so it's it, it's fully integrated. But the the thing that you're looking for, like plot this and put it to a file, doesn't work. But it's a great idea. It's an absolutely great idea. Uh, I saw other hands. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Uh, let's talk about performance counters then. All right. Um, like I said before, these are probably one of my favorite things. I love instrumentation. Um, it's one of the first things I do when I create new software. Uh, and so if we look at what happens when we request a, a uh, performance counter, uh, right now we get back a couple of things. We get back a timestamp and we get back uh, a set of counter samples, right? In this case, I just asked for one, uh, uh, I asked for one counter. If I had asked for multiple, I would have gotten back a, like an array of counter samples for every timestamp. Um, but what I want to show you is, so what I'm going to do right now is expand um, that property, the counter samples property. I want to expand that. I'm going to blow that out so you can see what's in there. So I'm going to get the same counter. I'm going to select and expand the counter samples property. Uh, and what I want you to see here uh, is a couple of things. One, there's a cooked value inside of that counter sample that actually represents, most of the time, represents the value for that, that counter. So in this case, this is the total, the percent processor time across all of my CPUs, and I'm using a little less than 2%. That's what that means. Uh, one of the other things that you can't see, let's see, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, if I do a get member on that, um, uh, if I get, do a get member on that counter sample, uh, here's everything that's in there, right? So you can see the cooked values in there. 
Uh, there's also a timestamp property, right? And that actually represents when the instant in time that that sample was taken. So if you get one of those, if you get like a whole bunch of counter samples from the same timestamp, they'll all have the same timestamp. Right. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at what we can do in terms of plotting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to get that same counter, um, and I'm going to pipe it to out chart. One of the things that I want to point out at this point uh, is that I'm not actually running the command. I've wrapped it in squiggly brackets, which changes it into a what? Script block, all right? Uh, and you'll notice I've also added the continuous flag on get counter. Um, so what? Anybody knows what ha what happens when you specify a dash continuous on get counter? It never, it never returns, right? It just keeps spitting out data until you tell it to stop. Um, so what I'm actually doing now, I'm defining a script block that continuously pulls for this performance counter. It'll never stop. Um, and I'm, I'm pulling out all the counter samples out of that. That's what that script block does. And I'm piping that script block, right? So the code that I want to plot, I'm piping that to outchart. I'm not actually piping the objects that are coming out. I'm not actually piping the uh, performance counter data. Right? I'm piping the code that gets the performance counter data. That's what I'm plotting. Right? And you'll see, you'll see why I'm doing that uh, when, I, when I hit the go button here. Uh, there it goes. Right? So at this point, uh, I've got a live chart. It's actually pulling data out of my system uh, actively. Uh, but I can still actually use my shell. So I can actually come over here and still do a you know, DIR on my charts or whatever it is I need to do. Uh, but that chart will just keep going, right, until I, until I kill it, until I close it. Is that a new ping for every, is a new image for every update that's being drawn? Uh, no, what's, what's actually happening is, um, so whenever data comes through, so it's sort of like a job. It's not a job. It's not a job object, but it's kind of like a job, right? So it sort of runs in its own scope. And um, there's somebody actively looking at the data coming out of that pipeline. Um, and the reason it's not a job is because I don't want anyone else pulling data out of the pipeline and keeping it from me, right? I want it to plot everything that's in there. Uh, so, so as the data comes out, as soon as it comes out, it sort of updates the list of data, and that actually triggers the redraw of the changed, Im changed parts of the, uh, of the image. Uh, so if I actually did an export image on this right now, it would take a, like a snapshot of whatever happened to be on screen. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so I have a live plot now. Um, you'll notice that it's getting the, you know, it's figured out cook value is being plotted by the timestamp. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, uh, I can use the same technique. I'm gonna do the same thing, uh, except for a different counter. I'm gonna get the percent user time instead of the percent processor time. Uh, I'm putting it on the same chart this time. So I'm gonna plot a line on the CPU chart. That's the name, same name that I was using before. Um, but it's the same kind of plot, so let's see what, uh, let's see what happens then. All right. Uh, so I figured out, I was like, oh, we already have a chart. We already have a series on there. I'm just going to go ahead and add another one. Um, and, uh, and you can see, like, they're not, it's not like Perfmon where everything's, like, nice and lined up. They're actually two different, two different sort of threaded data sources that are just kind of throwing data at this thing, and whenever it shows up, it shows up on the chart. Um, and there's a couple other things that aren't really working the way they should. Like you'll notice, that you can't tell which series is which. They're both called cook value because uh, that's what's being plot. It's, as far as it knows, there's two data sources. That's what you want to see. It doesn't really understand. Uh, we'll talk about how to fix that in just a second. Can you block the Y scale so that it stays? That's one of the things that's not working right now, but it should be. Um, and in fact, like the original examples of this, these were taken from the, uh, like from the documentation of Seashell. Uh, you'd specify it's a percentage, right? So you just specify from zero to 100, and the y-axis just locks in on there like it does in Perfmon. So you get a nice stable, stable graph. But yeah, it's good that you noticed that. Um, let's see. Yeah. So again, you know, the, the big issue here is that the the coordination of these two plots is they're, it's not they're not coordinated. They're kind of independent, but they're sort of being hand drawn over each other uh, at this point. So let me kill this. Uh, and what I need to talk to you about now. Uh, to understand the next part uh, is this concept of, let's see, is it going to come up? There we go. Uh, samples and series, right? So we had talked about a series. In the previous plot, we had two series, two performance counters spitting out data, and it kind of looked like this, right? We had uh, two data sources that we defined. 
say plot that, plot that performance counter, and now you're done with that. Now also go plot this performance counter, and so now there's two data sources independently throwing data onto the graph. Uh, and then and they show up independently, right? They show up as two independent series uh, on the graph. Uh, that's not really the ideal way to do it. That's actually really intense uh, on the whole stack, uh, and it's not really what you want. Um, what, what actually happens, right? We have this data source when we define one of those script blocks, then we pipe it to outchart. It creates one of these data sources, and what happens is every time an object comes out of the pipeline, Seashell says, oh, there's a data sample, right? And again, this is something that, it's a term I'm reusing from like the research days of, like, this, is a, this is a unit of data that I can look at, right? And sort of expects every time something comes out of the pipeline, that that's something you want to plot, that's one thing. Um, one of the things that Seashell does is it lets you define uh, multiple series inside of a single sample, right? So you can have an object come out of the pipeline, and you can look at it and say, oh, there's eight series in there, or five series, right? And as long as you define what they are and how to find them, Seashell is fine to figure it out for you and, and plot them. Um, and the, the benefit of that is that you get the nice perfmon looking, you know, the sam all these samples were taken at the same time, and it just sort of feels more coherent, I guess. It's probably a really bad word to use uh, for this kind of smoke and mirror stuff. But, um, so, you know, there's this difference between the sample of data that's coming out of the pipeline and the series of data. They're, they're, they can be one-to-one, -one, but they don't always have to be. So let's look about, uh, let's look at how we can, uh, how we can break up a single sample uh, into multiple series. So I'm gonna run um, uh, this command here. Uh, again, We're what I'm gonna do. Right now on the screen. Oh, geez, thank you. There we are. All right, so um, I'm changing things up a little bit. Uh, one of the, what I'm doing right now is I've changed the query for the, uh, the performance counter. So instead of just getting the total for all CPUs, which is one value, I'm using star, which is, indicates what? All processors. All processors, yeah. So give me the percent processor time for all processors. Uh, and I'm also, you notice I'm, I was previously expanding on the counter samples. I'm not doing that anymore. Or I'm not doing it inside of the, the pipeline anymore. What I'm doing is I'm just querying for the performance counter data. Remember we get back the timestamp and the counter samples. The counter samples has an array of those values, right? This is where things get kind of weird. So what I'm saying here is, I'm, um, yeah, so let's get the counter data for all the processors. And then I'm going to plot a line, line plot. I'm going to call it CPUs. Plot the cooked value by the timestamp like we were doing before. Except this time, do it across everything you find in the counter samples property. Right? So again, the across parameter is trying to define, like, that's where the series is. Like, there's a list of data items in there, and in, inside of each of those, inside of each object, inside of each sample, you're going to find a property named counter samples. Right? Each one of those represents a series of data that I want you to plot on my chart. And inside of that series, there's going to be a cooked value, and there's going to be a timestamp. Right? And now things are getting a little wonky. Who's lost? Nope. All right, good. Um, and then this last one, the, the key on is really just a way to, it's like a hint. I'm telling, telling Seashell, it's like, when you see the series, this is its name. This property value that you, that you see there inside the series, it's name. In this case, it's the path, uh, which is the path of the performance counter. All right, so relatively concise-ish. Uh, let's go ahead and run that. Uh, give it a second. And yep, there it goes. So at this point, you'll notice like all the dots are like lined up directly on top of each other. Uh, it's actually pulling out all of the, the correct paths for the, um, the performance counters, and you can actually figure out which, you know, which line goes with which, uh, uh, with which, you know, which, which processor. Uh, yeah, so, um, and again, again, it's not perfect. Again, you'll, you'll notice the y-axis is completely messed up. Like, it's actually, it's, I, what I've done is broken the mapping between like the units that are being used in the series with the series name, and it's just it's messing everything up. Um, but again, it's just one of those things that's got to get fixed. Uh, moving to oxyplot. All right. So again, the across and key on parameters. Again, if you have sample of data that contains lots of series that you want to plot, that's where those uh, come into play. Um, all right. And let's see what we can do about fixing some of those labeling issues. Um, so this is the last thing that I, that I was going to demo. 
Um, uh, so you remember before I said, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plot, um, you know, the, this, I wanna plot this data and it's, uh, the units are bytes and I want it to be light blue. Uh, when you're using the across and key on parameters is actually, um, we can define, you can define a uh, series matching, which is sort of like, like you're saying this is, you find, a, find a series that kind of looks like this name, right? And these are the properties that I want you to apply to it. Uh, it's kind of the way that I think about this. And again, I've hemmed and hawed about how to do this, but there's a series parameter that you can pass to outchart. And the idea of this is to say, this is how I want you to define the series. Um, and the first parameter, it's a hash table. The first, the keys in the hash table are regular expressions, right? And for the most part, I just use plain strings like timestamp and cook value. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna look at it's going to look at the value being plotted, and it's going to look at the label being plotted, and it's going to see, like, well, does one of those look like it, is it labeled timestamp? You know, does it have the word timestamp in it somewhere? Oh, then it matches this series. Oh, does it have the word cook value in there? Well, then it matches this series. Um, again, it's not really, it's, it's kind of difficult to explain. It's a lot easier to see. So if I go ahead and run this. Um, I mean, it's, it's not even plotting yet, but you can see it's, it's figuring out that, oh, the x-axis is a timestamp. Like, I found that series of data. Um, and also, you know, I, I'm matching, let's see, let me show the code again. I actually asked it to match the string cooked value. Like, if you see the, if you see the word cooked value in the name of a series, um, then it's a percent. That's the unit I want you to use. And so it's looking at the names up here and it's saying, oh, look, cooked value. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a percent. Right. Uh, so that it's kind of this really loose regex based matching again trying to keep the syntax terse uh, it's very easy to make mistake by the way um, doing it that way so I don't know how I don't know if that's gonna actually gonna make it in to the final product yet. Is, is the percent unit what made that a much smoother line instead of uh, no I, great question so yeah the question is did the did changing the unit of the the values to percent make it a smooth line and the answer is no uh, actually it's the type it's a different type of oh. plot called the spline uh, yeah, so columns, lines, splines, um, and you know, the, the ones that will be working include things like scatter, uh, which are just plotted, bubble, uh, plotted dots, bubbles, which are dots with some kind of girth, um, steps, waterfalls, areas, yeah, so um, this guy, again, it just depends on what people want. There's a lot of plots that exist that you don't, <laughs> I don't even know how to read. So I'm not sure I'm going to include them. Uh, like heat maps are a great one. Like I, I look at a heat map, I'm like, that's ah, interesting. No idea what it does. Thanks. Um, uh, anywho, so yeah, this is in the original C shell. There were there was an out grid, there was an out timeline, there was an out network, um, et cetera, et cetera, and they all look like this, and they all work like this, right? The same set of parameters. Uh, same set of, of sampling and series definitions, same, you know, same ability to differentiate different parts of the series and plot, uh, trying to use some very simple matching techniques. But um, uh, so again, my idea with this, getting rid of most of the craft is to try to make it simpler. So, um, you know, at moving forward, if you have input uh, as public releases panel available, I would love the feedback on how to not make this complicated, yeah. So basically with this information you have, you could go back to uh, past counter samples and, and graph them independently. Um, is there a way inside your charts um, drive to to close that chart, like remove it? Uh, yeah, actually. So um, in theory, yes. Let's see. Um, the idea, if I go into charts, let's find a, let's find one with the easy <coughs> name. All right. So we have a chart named CPU sample. Remove item CPU samples. Uh, that's that's supposed to work. <laughs> right? uh, that's the idea. Shh, look, uh, and what happens is, um, uh, yeah. So we by just by removing item. It, Hope my viewer watch this. So yeah. so basically, you could go uh, do performance counters on a couple hundred systems, and then you could on your system collect that, run it through this tool have to go ahead and draw the chart, export that from the drive actually out to an image, and then delete yeah. uh, the chart and have an automated charting system for some of your performance uh, samples yeah. uh, that you collect. That, yeah, and that's, that's the idea. Um, it, there's probably easier ways to do that. 
I think, actually, if I was going to. Like, if that's a goal, like, is that something that a lot of people would think they would no, I, want? If, 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 you know, someone called and said, we are, you know, collecting this data, what does it look like? And you need to, right. you know, do something at hoc. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's actually really great feedback. Um, the, uh, like, so the, the, the image export was sort of an afterthought of the visualization itself. Like, I was like, oh, I see it. That's great. And, like, I want to show it to somebody. And, like, oh, I can't do that because it's moving, you know. Um, so that, but actually being able to draw it without rendering it, you know, or being able to save it to a file without rendering it um, sounds like actually very useful. Uh, the more I think about it, the more, the more I think that's well worth looking into. So I'll see what I can do there. Um, so, I mean, in terms of feedback, I'm almost afraid to ask because uh, we're almost out of time. But I mean, in terms of the syntax of this command and trying to figure out, like, I have this object, how do I plot the crap that's in there? Um, like, I'm not even comfortable. <laughs> and I wrote it right, uh, and I wrote it in 2012, and I've actively worked on it since then, right? And I keep coming back to it, and I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like, I don't like the way this works, right? Um, so any ideas you have on what that should look like, I would love to hear them. Yeah. It might be easier to have parameters to let the user specify like what they want to call the x and y axis. I think it's cool that you can you can like key in and you're kind of like doing calculator property there with the regex stuff. Right, yeah. Like using it, that seems like it'd be a little hard to use in a pipeline. Like it might be easier I agree. to natively say, hey, call x this, call y that. Okay. All right. Okay, so let let's revert let me let me invert the question. Do you think you'll ever plot do you think you'll ever plot two series on the same graph that have different units? So you're, I don't know, plotting bytes and kilobytes or something like that. Hours and minutes. Well, I don't know a lot about chart theory, but it seems like having like one like one unit would probably be easier. Okay. So for someone to because that would I mean that eliminates a lot of problems if that's you know if, if all you want if you want one unit of values, a lot of these problems go away. Because um, a lot of this is is magic, just looking at data, and going, okay, well, this, these are doubles, so let's find a name for our double data that kind of looks like what we're supposed to map this to, and we'll figure out which axes to put it on then, and right. Um, but again, like all of the the axes naming and the matching and stuff, the reason that's broken is because of that. Because I want the ability to say, oh, I'm plotting bytes, and now I'm plotting megabytes, and I want two different scales there to represent that data. But again, that's just from my experience of that's what you do, and if that's not what you do, then that's I don't want to have to maintain it. Got to be honest with you. So uh, maybe I'll simplify that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's on their head. Good. All right. Thanks. I don't know. I must drop a body a little bit in C sharp, um, and this makes more sense to me than trying to do it in C sharp. Honestly. All right. <laughs> um, I'm a little floored that someone would say that. Uh, <laughs> But um, so I mean, like the thing about like plotting out of C sharp, the, all of these plot li libraries are designed to you create a plot and you give it data and then it's like, poof, you know, and there's the plot and it's just done. Um, and sometimes they activate, you know, they, they'll they'll update themselves and sometimes they won't. Um, the the thing about PowerShell is like you're you're pulling stuff out and sometimes there's a property and sometimes there isn't and sometimes you create your own property and that's kind of different than what these plots want to chart in the first place. So there's like all this stuff that's happening in the back end about, um, you know, oh, I'm defining a script block, so now I got to define a parameter on the object that can actually calculate that, that the plot can bind to, right? So there's like this huge layer in Seashell of getting from PowerShell's loose concept of an object and, and letting you, you know, malleate that to your, to your own benefit to C Sharp's definition of an object, which is very strict. You know, it's got to have a name, it's got to have a specific binary signature, it's got to look like this before I can do anything with it. Um, but yeah, that's actually the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge of this. So, all right. Well, we're out of, out of time, so uh, I'm gonna I start. I just had one one quick uh, thought was uh, when you were doing on the sample when you did the uh, calculated property. Yes. Maybe um, the ability to uh, do something similar, like with a select object, when you create uh, a custom column and you can provide a label. A name, yeah. Right. And exactly. Like actually, use the property, pass that property in, and yeah. use that as the label, and, uh, and then use the calculation as the thing. Actually, I really like that idea. Um, I'm kind of wondering why that didn't pop into my head, uh, but I like the idea of that, and also the you know the part where you're specifying what the units are and the color. That's actually a really clean way of doing that. Like, I want to plot this that looks like this across you know the names. I like that. 
I'm going to look into that. All right. Any other questions before I wrap up? Nope. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah.